And this game uh, this took place also in 1994 in Moscow. This is Grandmaster Victor Moskalenko with the white pieces. See Knight F3. And here's um, the line we haven't seen. We have seen Knight F3, but we haven't seen the early exchange on uh, D5 in the Knight F3 line. And um, it's been well known for years that um, Bishop G4 here. C takes, and after bishop takes f3, that white white should not uh, really play. Sorry. This this move right here is d takes c6. Because after bishop, b takes c6, uh, it's just uh, complete equality for black as he's able to retain uh, his bishop here. Okay. Black's plan, excuse me, white's plan at that point would be try would be would be to try to uh, devise some type of plan around knight c3 and possibly f3 and e4 to try to get a big uh, center. You know, so if I was researching this line and wanted to try to try some offbeat line. Perhaps that's a direction that you could look into is knight c3 and trying to devise a plan around f3 and e4. But normally, c takes d5, bishop takes, white takes with the pawn. What this does is, again, it gives white center a lot of advanced uh, potential. Again, I refer you to the game between Gary Kasparov and uh, Vasily Ivanchuk. I think it was 95, uh, if I'm correct. <clears throat> but... Besides giving the uh, center uh, a big uh, boost, it also opens up uh, the file and diagonals for the bishop. So, file, excuse me, the file for the rook, the G file, and the diagonal for the bishop. Remember, white has the bishop pair. The open lines, open lines are good uh, when you have the bishop pair. And um, so, the price for White's little pawn, you know, um, um, disfigurement, so this, so to speak, is that he gets excellent um, diagonals and files for his rooks. Diagonals for his bishops and files for his rooks. Queen takes d5, e3, and now we see the attack is already on against a huge center. Knight c3, bishop b4, bishop d2, there goes the other bishop. Again, White center gets even stronger. Queen d6. This is an old time move also. It's been known really for a long time. Not to really uh, just leave the queen there. Because of c4 with tempo. So the queen usually drops back. Bishop g2. Knight g e7. And now f4. And again this attacks the, um, the center. And... Black, of course, is not planning on, excuse me, White is not planning on capturing with the E pawn and destroying his center. But, as again, continuation shows, his plan is to move, remove White's pawn from the, uh, Black's pawn from the central square E5 so that his own pawn majority be can become ma uh, active. So he can move, remember, mobilization, it's not, it's not just about having a big pawn center, but the pawn center is dangerous when you can move, when you can advance the pawn. So notice after this capture, e4, castle, e5. You see how the pawns are moving and attacking. Queen g6, castles, knight f5, bishop takes f4. So he gets his pawn back and he has a mobile uh, center. Knight h4 and we see the counterattack. That's what you have to do. Black must counterattack. Bishop drops back. Knight knight takes g2, so it gets rid of a dangerous bishop. Rook a d8. Again, this is all about trying to demobilize those pawns. Queen b1, offering the ending. F5. And now, it's a, I love this move. F5 because <clears throat> it puts black in a, a funny... Excuse me, puts white in a funny situation. Now... If he takes, he takes, then this queen takes here. Again, he got rid of one of the dangerous um, pawns. And again, the center is totally demobilized because he can't move that pawn. Right? Neither one of these pawns can move. 
that's a net benefit for black. And you're threatening, you know, moves, you know, just penetrating in the position. Queen F3 check. Boom, picking up the uh, pawn. <clears throat> He takes, queen takes, king g1, h5, continuing on with the attack. Now, here, I think Moro got a little ambitious here because white could just take at this point. The queen takes b7. However, he doesn't, he doesn't do it. He plays h4 because the idea in mind is if queen takes b7 here, um, black will play here and then, um, course you take and now this guy gets distracted over here and you trade pieces and of course you got to worry about this stuff here but at the queen c4 check you got an out all right so let's say king h8 let's say i don't know queen e2 And then after that, you would just go here. So I think um, white would be okay. But that move is understandable. H4. You know, it's like a knee-jerk a knee -jerk reaction. Queen F3. Queen B3 check. Rook D5. Again, he could have just grabbed a B pawn. I think. Let me see. Knight D8. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah. Okay, so rook a e one, <clears throat> knight a five, queen b four, rook d f five, rook e three, queen g four, and Morozevich is able to obtain enough activity and distraction um, that white cannot do anything with those pawns, and finally. Them being uh, stationed in one position for so long on C3 and D4 respectively. They get attacked and slowly bro uh, break down. Queen takes E4. Rook takes. C takes. C takes. Again, pressure on the pawn. Knight C6. Bishop E5. Again, pressure on the pawn. See, the attack is relentless on the center. And again, another nice ending to the central pawns. I love seeing the pawns disappear uh, from the center. And at this point, the players uh, agreed to a draw. So good game. Both players, you know, near 2,600 at the time. And uh, demonstrating uh, good play from both sides. Again, you see this position at the end. And, you know, just contrast that. You know how it looked a few moves ago. You had this intimidating uh, center, especially after E takes F4 and E4. But you saw how um, Morozevich handled that. I forgot to tell you that that game was from a match the two played. Uh, Victor Moskalenko and Alexander Morozevich. So that was from the uh, fifth game in the match uh, where... Uh, Morozavich empl uh, employed the Shigorin and they had a draw. This game is two two games later. Morozavich uh, had the black pieces again. And uh, Victor Moskalenko uh, gave it another shot. So you see the same line. And so now each player got to see what each player was trying to do. And so it's interesting to see when they both come back to the same uh, playground again to see who's uh, prepared what. So here, I was just saying how normally uh, at this point you drop the queen back to d6. Here, Morozevich says forget about that theory and, <laughs> and plays uh, knight g e7 here. And now here, white could have, could have played e4, which is probably stronger than even c4. c4 is playable also. But again... I don't think Queen D6 is like a recommended continuation. But Morozavich is, you know, that type of player. I get away with things like that at times. So, Knight G7, C4 hitting, Queen D6, and D5. 
And this is why Queen D6 was always played. Knight B8. And this is good for white. Bishop B2. Knight D7. And H4. Um, Maybe Rook G1. More to the point. Putting the... Uh, I like Rook G1 attacking the G7 pawn. And I also like F4. Because the bishop is on B2. H4 does to me doesn't doesn't get the job done for me. It seems kind of uh, it's like you're anticipating something, but he just castles. Bishop D3, and here comes the assault against the center. And the timing is right because notice White has just put his bishop on D3. And if he plays e4 now to bolster the center, it makes his decision to put the bishop there look kind of dubious. And then, say, after knight g6, right, because after e4 is played, the f4 square is now newly weakened. So, and then after here, here, then your best bet is probably re reorganizing this bishop somewhere. But again, black is black is good good to go here. The, the pawns have been the big center has been demobilized, and so now it's just a bunch of weakness for uh, white to hop around. This is why you don't see e4 here. You don't see e4 because it doesn't work there. D takes. This is up. Uh, this is once you start seeing that, it's good for black. Because that's really all White has to his White's claim to fame is that huge center in the bishop here. So once you see the huge center break down, it's it's uh, trouble for Black. Uh, excuse me for White because White Black's pieces are extremely active. They were just they were just being kind of held back by the big center. But once the center is gone, then the pieces just start running wild. Bishop e4, queen e6, rook g1, f6. King h8. So Marvin Davis doesn't, you know, doesn't want to play this move, which is possible. But then White could just play Bishop to take b7 here. Okay. So instead, he just plays King h8. Rook c1. Knight c5. And h5. So we see that uh, white is trying to make, you know, some some kind of attack here. And notice too, again, like um, here, there's no check. So f5 would just seal the deal with this bishop. H5, h6. A4 was played. Rook a c8. Bishop a3. B6, B takes, Rook takes, King E2, and F5, and now we can see it's Black now who has taken over the center. And these, this is like underlies a lot of the theory behind, you know, the so-called modern openings and hypermodern. Is that basically you allow your opponent to occupy the uh, central squares early? You pressure those said squares with your pieces eventually the opponent's center deteriorates breaks down and then you take over the center with your own pawns as your pieces are already poised to um support that center so you're just seeing a lot of uh you know a lot of class you know a lot of good chess uh you know theory being played out with king e1 Again, same principles. Mobilize the center. And this is a tactical mobilization because of the weakness on F2. So bishop e2, right? Can't take that pawn. Now just opening up the position with the king in the middle of the board. F4, e takes, queen takes, queen c3. And little tactical thing here going on. If queen takes f3, then there's checkmate. Can't allow that. Rook e5. King f1, and now queen takes f3. That's brutal from Morozevich, and a beautiful uh, win in the 
um, Shigorans. Nineteen ninety four Tilburg round two with the white uh, white pieces Grandmaster Vadim Mylov. And we've seen all of this before. And now we see this position similar, it reminds me of uh, a Bovinic variation, the Queen's Gambit a decline somewhat. And it's, <clears throat> we see the advancement of these pawns on the queen side. So E takes, B takes, B takes, E takes F6. Queen A4 check, C6, D takes, and now Queen E7 check. Bishop E2, some wild stuff going on here. And right into the end game. And black is, is equalized because there's no center. White has no center. Um... And he and now with the queens off, there's no danger to either king. He gets the pawn back. Only thing he has to worry about is the pawn on C, the uh, C file. Morris Davis starts to attack that pawn. He gets it. And we can see that. Mylov blundered, and his piece, his piece is, is trapped. Let's go back just a little bit. Like I said, we're running through these games briefly. We had a lot of games, but here again, the game, the the game is uh, you know, pretty equal. But here is where uh, My Mylov starts to go wrong. I mean, it looks like a natural move, but he starts getting in trouble here. Um, even here's a good move right here, knight, uh, knight to b4. Because this practically forces white to straighten out the pawns for, uh, black. After this. But in the continuation, knight a5 was chosen with the more direct attack against his pawn. And then after rook d3, which wasn't bad, Moro went back. Double in the rooks. Rook e8, rook e1, and this is this was like the the error uh, in the situation. Perhaps to keep attacking with the move, a knight d4 might have been a little, at least a little better. So after um, after knight takes c4, then you can play knight takes here, f takes, bishop b7, and then at least try to pick up. Maybe this pawn on a6. So after rook e1, the pawn just dropped. Bishop b7 with a similar idea. But then after rook c5, bishop takes a6. Then rook a8 was played. And now really the only move is to play bishop takes c4. Whereby you will lose this pawn at the end anyway. However, you still have some drawing chances with this four, with the four to three on the same side. So better for white would have been just to exchange. Rook takes here and here. However, he played bishop b7. Rook attacked it. The bishop went to e4, and then there was nowhere where to go after f5. So this line right here didn't really give um, white uh, too much in the position. This um, this line with bishop g5. e4 is probably a lot better there. e4, e3, either one, but not bishop. Bishop g5 can stay home. Round three, Tilburg. Same tournament, Kirill, Gior Kirill Georgiev. Grandmaster with the white pieces again, knight c3, and we see here the um, the employment of the move e4. Bishop g5, I don't think it's that good. Bishop e3, e6, bishop takes c4, and what I see here is an approach, the same approach that Victor Korsnoy used a few games ago. If you've been, you know, um, paying attention, 
And I just want to say too, ladies and gentlemen, this is a long video series, a long video. I'm putting everything on one video, but I don't expect you to watch the whole thing at once. Watch it a little at a time. Maybe watch one game a day or two games a day or something like that. And, um, you know, but if you if you're real, like really into it, you can watch the whole thing. Be my guest. But I'm not making it. I'm not recording it in the expectation that you watching the whole thing, you know, just sitting down and watching, you know, uh, all of this. But if you do, that's fantastic. All right. So Queen E7, Bishop E2, and now E5. Um. Now I believe Courtney in this position, if I remember correctly, played Bishop to B5. You know, I had this threat of uh, doubling the pawns, and then I think Moro went back to B8. But here, I think that might be a little better. But here, he plays Bishop E2, avoiding double pawns himself. But then this gives Moro the chance to play e5. So again, getting playing bishop b5 and driving this knight away prevents this move e5. So Georgiev wanted to go into this type of position. D5. So we have this fixed center now. Knight takes d4, e takes. And now rook takes. Bishop takes. So a bunch of pieces have been traded off. Bishop c5. So a ton of pieces have been traded off, traded off, but White still has uh, his space in the center. But the king is also in the center. King e2, and we see Moro going after some activity. So here we go. Here's the uh, attempt at uh, um, tearing down the center. Now, hmm, f5. And again, I wanted to illustrate if if white tries to advance, then he drops the pawn after knight takes e5. Notice the, cent the center is only attacked when when it is shown that it cannot uh, it, it cannot uh, advance or be mobile. So Moro uses this opportunity to attack and destroy his opponent's center. So knight e5 now. And rook e1 was played. Now, um, a more straightforward move is just g4 holding that pawn. And it's not sure if, you know, I'm not sure if black even has any compensation for that. Like, I don't see any. Instead, rook e1 was played. And the pawn was captured. Rook d e2. Queen f3, enjoying the pin. Queen e4, queen h5, and at this point the game is is equal. I didn't see any reason for White to give up that um, that pawn like that. G takes, king gets out the way. King g7, queen takes f3, king b8, and a little tactical shot here. Knight takes c7, rook f8. Rook c3 now. Georgiev goes into the uh, the ending where um, white is a little bit better. Rook e6, rook d7. d6. Rook f8. Knight d5, rook ff7. Knight takes f6, is just dropping the pawn unceremoniously. Now, um, rook d8 is just met by rook c7. Um, if knight e5. You could play rook uh, rook c7, or you could play a move like knight e4 here. Rook g7, and at this point, uh, Moro's in trouble, and that's going to be mate if uh, he takes that rook. So rook df7, and then the pawn is going to promote. So there, ladies and gentlemen, you see uh, Moro Moro's Avis drop the game. 
there and um in the uh Shigorin. and you saw an example of although he was able to successfully attack the center uh with f5 that he could not completely um he could not completely destroy the center and eventually it was this uh d pawn that eventually would um you know would win the game for him especially after the c pawn uh was removed that c pawn that uh you know, we talked about at the beginning of uh, this discussion that, you know, uh, it's often in classical uh, Queen's Gambit defenses is utilized, um, you know, a lot in the defense of the, um, you know, the center uh, for the black player. All right. Had to get some coffee. Let's continue now. We already uh, went over that. Um, let's keep going here. Just show you real quick though. Knight takes f7. If you try to do like a, you know, move like that, um, right? You have this pin here. D6 is killer. And again, that that pawn right there was just very, uh, very strong. Let's go. One year later, to the uh. Donner Memorial, which took place in Amsterdam in um, 1995. And now, here we have the, um, I think he's from Peru. I want to say Peruvian Grandmaster uh, Julio Granda Zuniga. If, uh, yeah, I believe he's from Peru. Like, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Knight of three, but if I'm wrong, please cor please correct me. You know I'm not I'm uh you know I didn't have my uh my notes ready for that one. I I think it's from Peru though. Um. So again, familiar line in Shigorans, and we can see here that Zuniga. Right, we spoke about this. That usually white will white won't uh capture on d6 but instead we'll make this more rec this recommended move of g takes right taking the bishop here from black uh and opening up lines for his bishops and his rooks here we see an offbeat line and we see an alternate plan which is good for white also so here's the plan e6 and basically the plan is uh with the knight Gone from f3, we'll see um, the same plan of building up the big center, but with f3. Very solid. Queen h4, just to make some holes in the position. And now we have Queen h5 from Morozevich. Bishop e2, castle. Bishop e3, and again, as, in all, as always, the job is the same for black. In this type of position. Uh, if you let white solidify the center, it's going to be over. Solidify, you know, support the center structurally and um, develop all of his pieces, right? And get him in the right spots. He's just going to run you run you over with the, uh, with the powerful center. Black has to jump on the job immediately. This explains the next move, F5. Looks weird, but it must be done in these type of positions. You can't, you can't let white sit there and just castle get the rooks in the center and just you know mow you you know mow you down queen b3 attacking the uh bishop there bishop takes of course playing at shigorin you don't really care about holding on to the bishops too much f takes e4 queen takes uh e6 check bishop d7 and now queen takes e4 so we can see a little bit of uh Damage to white center here, right? The e4 pawn is now gone. And, um, however, white is up a pawn here and has a bishop here. All right, so with the open f and e files, black is going to be playing for dynamic activity. White at this point is going to be trying to, uh, uh, safely, um, consolidate and hopefully trade some pieces off and, realize his pawn advantage uh later but right now safety is what's important 
And um, huh. I think best here is probably just Rook E7. And just continuing getting the pieces into the game, or even Rook uh, Rook to F8, Rook H to F8, at this point. Morrow plays Bishop A4 here. Perhaps he wanted to keep his opponent from um, going over to the queen side, castle and queen side. Um, and here, Zuniga just played king f2. And now rook hf8. So he got him over to the queen side where he wants him. h4. Queen to g6. And rook ab1. And right here... Uh, whew, tough position. Uh, I I like Black's position because his his position is solid. He's down a pawn, but he has good uh, activity here. It's hard to see exactly where to you know how to get in though for Black. He attacks his pawn, and now Bishop D1 attacking the bishop, preserving pieces, and now D5. So remember, we gotta watch out for the mobile center. Queen e7, so now we see an attempt to demobilize the center. Rook comes up. Queen c5 check. King gets safe. Rook f7. Queen d2 now. Rooks double up. And the bishop pair is a menace. Notice how the rooks can't really penetrate into the uh, white position. That's annoying. There goes a the bishop pair. But also a bunch of pieces get traded off. This makes uh, White's task a little bit easier. Remember, White is up a pawn. And now he's up two pawns after that. Um, problem is, if uh, if h6 here, then just uh, bishop d3. You know, protecting this pawn here. Another idea is rook a3, right? Trying to grab this pawn, then bishop b3, and then a5 with the idea a4. <coughs> Excuse me. Back to the game, b6 was played, and he grabbed that pawn. There's the a3, and then the bishop just came back. Moro gets the c pawn. This brings the rook in with tempo, however. Queen c2 threatening mate. This causes another pawn to be extracted. King b7. And now the game is uh, over. So I'll give the rest with, uh, you know, brief as brief comments as possible. It's just too many, too much material uh, given up in, in the uh, position. So Moro had to resign. In uh, round one of this tournament. Very interesting. And um, I think it was kind of. Uh, you know good strategy from Zuniga. To, to come with this line. That's really. Eh, not not you know not played too much. You know. He actually he took. he, he uh, Instead of taking with the G pawn. He played this line. Very solid. But of course he, his position did come under scrutiny. And it took some good maneuvers to. Uh, make sure that he didn't get in deep trouble. The next outing of Shigorans came in the same tournament, round six, against a uh, former FIDE world champion, uh, Alexander Halifman, who's rated 2655. Here's another line. Uh, I'm not sure if we've seen this line yet uh, since I've, I've done this uh, video. So this might be the first um, time. But this is another popular line of C takes D5. Queen takes D5. And of course, Knight C3 cannot be played because the Queen would just capture the pawn. So E3 first. You see E5. And the pressure is immediate. And part of the reason the E5 besides uh, putting pressure on the center is to play Bishop B4 after Knight C3. Bishop d2, again, you can't be afraid to part with the bishop if you play the Shigorans. 
Knight f6, there's the piece play we've spoken about. c4, queen d6, d5, so there's the advancing center. Knight e7, and so there's the pressure on that center to mobilize, to demobilize it. And uh, moves like c6 are often in the cards to break it down. And or the move f5 if e4 ever shows up on the board for white. So queen b1. There's, there it is, e4, knight d7 now. And now there's two main breaks, c6 and uh, f5. Bishop d3, knight c5, knight e2. There it is, f5, castles, and f4. And we see play similar to this in the right, and our king's Indian or Dutch defenses. And the position is locked up, and we see white going for the king's side attack. Uh, excuse me, black going for the king's side attack. Of course, white doesn't really want the end game. Uh, black didn't really want it, but black bail, uh, white bails out. He still has tremendous pressure. And after <clears throat> after this trade of pieces, White has a slight advantage, but Moro does a good uh, job bringing this king to the center and keep you know keeping his pieces active. And the game uh, teetered out uh, to a draw in this uh, pure rook and pawn uh, ending here. Our next game. It was round eight, which was two rounds, um, you know, after. And with the black pieces, Grandmaster uh, Lord Van Viley, 25-85 at the time. And now you see knight c3 again. And with e4, bishop g4. And you see this classical approach to the center, as we first saw adopted by Victor Korsnoy. Knight e7, bishop e2. The bishop here is gone, and we see the immediate attack uh, on the center here. Castles. Queen c7. And queen b1 played. This move is interesting, uh, just taking the pawn, even though the pawn structure is messed up. The pawn is a pawn. And I guess Black's idea would be to recover with knight d7. However, you got a slick move here with bishop f4. And the idea is after e5, then you could just grab this knight. And say knight g6. And then you got a super powerful bishop. And I think that's worth the exchange. I think actually white, I like white better there. The two bishops, the, uh, and if you take that bishop, you're going to be connecting those pawns in the center. So basically that bishop is holding the whole position uh, prisoner. Yeah. So I think D takes C5 is an option there. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely D takes C5 is, is a good move there. Queen B1 instead, which is decent. B6, H3, Bishop H4, G4, Bishop G6. The pressure on the center, Bishop D3. That's a bad sign too. You start having to react to your opponent's um, moves. Rook F8, Knight E5, Queen B7. More pressure on the center. F3 is one of the ideas behind knight e5. Now c takes, c takes. So uh, Van Viley has done a good job of of protecting the center against attacks here. So right now I think white is better. He has to be careful because if 
black is able to somehow get behind those pawns, then he will be in trouble as his king is exposed and he's sort of weak on the dark squares. But his two bishops, his uh, nice presence in the center, knight on e5, kind of keeping white at a standstill right now. So white feels comfortable. He goes in, uh, starts trading off pieces. Knight d7. Knight takes d7, queen d7. Offering the end game. Moro rejects it because he wants to go check on g3. A couple of more moves are played. And I like how Van Wiley has been playing so far. G takes. E takes. And now queen c4 check. Interesting. Um, Bishop c4 check is uh, interesting also. But I can see him not wanting to take the pressure off or uh, the protection from e4. So he plays that. King h7. And now he plays a move d5. Which is a, a which is a mistake at this point. Um, better is probably e5, hitting the queen. And then Moral plays rook e8, which doesn't um, address the mistake that um, Van Wiley made. Here's here's what's wrong with the move. After f takes e4, f takes e4, we have queen e5 here again. Okay. Demobilizing the center. These pawns are now fixed. And uh say queen d4. For example, queen takes, takes, and then you have tactics here, like knight takes here, and then this uh bishop is in trouble and can't can't capture. Instead he did he did the move rook e8. Which is more of like a preparatory move or prelude to the combination I just showed you. Rook e1. And now he goes for f takes e4. F takes e4. And now queen d7. Now white is better here on paper. And I like to say on paper because practically it's hard to play positions like this when your king is exposed. Because that's just extra stress in the position. You have to worry about danger. And perpetual checks and things like that. And it's hard to always keep 100% focus on winning. But white is white is better. But then he plays king g3. Um, h5. So now he has to worry about the penetration of the king. So the king moves. Uh, excuse me of the queen. So the king moves to f2. But now Moro's queen gets in. And this turns the tides of the position. Now this knight f5, again tactics start to creep. Why? Because the pawn is immobilized on e4 because of the threat of the queen um, caption on e3. King keeps moving. And now Moro could have just took on h4 and been winning. But he plays the more um, flashy looking move, knight d6, attacking the queen and the pawn on e4. Queen c6, knight takes e4, check, ouch, bishop takes e4, rook takes e4. And notice how fast the um, white position falls apart. Just, you know, having the exposed king, you know, white was walking a tightrope. And yes, white was better technically, like if it was two engines playing, yes, he's, he's better. But just practically, it's very difficult. And so we see why Van Viley's position just went. Um, down in flames. Queen g2 check. This is nasty already. Queen takes a2. King d1. And rook c4. And um, Van Viley uh, was forced to resign. So he had a good game. He's better for a large portion of the game. But, um, you know, just having that king exposed like that. You know, he made like, uh, you know, some small errors. And next thing you know, the position uh, collapsed. Now, a few rounds later. And uh, at the Donner Memorial in Amsterdam, he uh, faced a, a young uh, Alexei Shirov, who had the white pieces, and the game went in familiar fashion. <coughs> and we can see this setup, uh, uh, if you're interested in attacking this from the white side, it's very, um, you know, very uh, good one. Uh, 
again, that we first saw in the uh, Victor Korsnoy game uh, early in Marvin Zavich's career, um, is very solid. And if uh, Black is not careful, he could be overrun uh, quickly by the huge uh, pawn center. And you can see here that White has no problem uh, accepting double pawns in order to open files and diagonals for his um, bishops and rooks. And his position does look rather intimidating. Uh, those bishops, the G file is uh, wide open. And, uh, you know, it looks, it, you know, it look, I wouldn't want to be in this position as, as black. But let's see what happened. And, of course, Shirov is a very feared attacking player at the time. Marvazevich immediately goes for his counterplay. Here comes the pawns. He sacrifices pawn to get his attack going. And Shirov gets his king out of the queen side. And now <clears throat> some pieces are traded off. Here, rook takes a2. Could have uh, definitely been play played here. He chose not to. And at this point, white White has an advantage. His white is definitely better if not close to winning. Position gets more and more simplified. And um, again, as in the Van Wiley game, the exposed nature of the king is, um, is really what saves black in this position. He, I mean, he's busted in this position. But um, he's able to use, utilize the checks to uh, get around, you know, get, get around, uh, you know, and get those queens traded off. And <clears throat> this, remind, this reminds me of, uh, you know, some of those funny end games. You get the F, you know, in theory, you get the F and H pawns and rook endings. And you still can't win. You could get rid of the pawn, the, uh, you know, the A pawn and still, uh, it's still, it still be a draw theoretically. And this is what happened in this game is more more Zavis drew, uh, practically, you know, at this point it's drawn, but he was, he was, uh, he was in a lot of trouble. Like I said, he was pretty much busted and, um, he was lucky lucky to draw draw that game against uh Shirov. You know, that doesn't say too much about this the Shig Shigoran being good, but uh definitely uh this line right here is definitely um you know definitely uh dan a dangerous line right here this this position uh in general although uh Moro you know was able to uh hold uh in this particular game. All right, continuing on. Again, another strong grandmaster. This is uh, from the Russian uh, Championship and the Lista, 1995, with the white pieces, Konstantin Asiev. Asiev, 25-30. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we see knight f3. So, by now, you should be familiar, even if it's just by osmosis, without any studying the main lines of the, of the Shigorin. You either see knight f3, you either see... Um, and you see knight c3, you know, either one of those are usually the main lines. And you have seen, of course, if you've been following this video, uh, c takes d5. Okay, those are the main lines of the Shigorin. <clears throat> the concepts are pretty much the same, is that usually white will try to um, utilize his extra <coughs> preponderance in the center to... Uh, push black's pieces away meanwhile black will try to demobilize at some point the white center and destroy it and utilize the free piece play uh, to attack so here you can see 
again white building up his standard big center c6 bishop takes rook c5 and black has to be careful <clears throat> to continuously um, make sure he has counterplay and that's what you see going on that way white can't just you know easily develop behind the center and um, crush black notice black has you know occupation and control of the b file he has a bishop on g6 therefore it's hard to you know make a move like e5 right he has he has uh, things going on in the position to counteract his opponent's a strong center right it's constantly distracting right rooks penetrating the position with that said with that said uh black still has to be very careful but white has something to think about too and that's really all you can ask for is um counterplay in the position Rook c5, the idea is guarding the queen from coming to g5, rook d2, and now bishop e2, and rook b, blah, rook b, b2. Um, rook takes e2 is bad on account of just rook, <laughs> rook takes b1. So this is why, uh, this is why he could get, you know, he can get away with that. Moro doesn't want to trade rook, so he just puts more pressure on the position. He plays bishop, I mean rook b to b2. Now the bishop is threatened. So rook e1. And again, we have some tactical things going on. So rook takes e2. Rook takes e2. Rook takes e2. And then queen takes c4. Attacking the rook here. And then let's say rook e1. King f2. And you can see. <clears throat> you can see that. Um, and then of course g3. And you can see that white. You know has compensation. Because that, that bishop on g6. Is kind of out of the game. It's kind of something that happens a lot in the Slav defense where sometimes that bishop goes to f5 early and then it'll get blocked out of the game um, by the pawns. So in this game, let's get back to where we were. Rook b, b2. Rook e1. Rook takes d4 here. <clears throat> and then now... Queen a6 was played. Which is a blunder. But. Here. There's a lot of little tactics here. Here if c takes d4. Then simply queen takes d4 check. And wherever the king moves. Then the queen will simply pick up the rook here. So after queen a6. You saw queen f6. And then rook c8. Going back again. After. Yes, I'm sorry. Rook takes d4. Queen a6. Queen f6. Rook c8. Rook d8. Takes. Takes. And now queen takes c4. Queen d2. King f1. Rook takes on a2, queen d4, rook d1, and here the game is, is equal. e5, and now queen d3. I like queen d5 because it threatens the, the rook. It right, gives them a little something to think about. Queen d3 is uh, more of like a pure defensive move. And then he can do what he wants to do. A5. So again, 
And he played queen b1, which threatens the rook. But I like queen d5 because he threatens the rook and cent centralizes the uh, the queen. So now rook d2. And also queen d5 prevents the move that just happened. Queen c1, rook takes, queen takes. It looks like we're headed toward the draw. C4, now F5, E takes, Bishop takes, and G4. And uh, Morozevich wind, wind up winning this, but I think he won on time. So the position, the position is, e you know, pretty much equal. You know, you could give white, like black, a slight nod, but um, he pretty he won that that one on time because it ended that move 40 in black. You know, black's flag uh, probably fell or something like that. Excuse me, white's flag uh, fell. Our next game is against uh, Piquet, Jerome Piquet, 26-25 at the PCA Intel Grand Prix. Nice C3, so familiar variation. You're probably learning the variation without even thinking about it. If you're watching this whole thing, you're just seeing the same moves over and over again. Again... If I was to ask you right now which variation did you saw most, you'd probably say this one, this nice C3 line. The Grandmaster's re, re, uh, relying on this as the most solid. And if you're white, you know, and it fits your style, maybe you should too. And and here's the idea, again, when we first saw this, uh, Victor Korsnoy played it. And uh, we saw it in several incantations. Sometimes Castle was played. I think uh, Lord Van Wiley Castle, um, uh, Queen side. Uh, excuse me, King side. Then we saw Shiroff play this variation where he wound up castling the Queen side. And now we're back to this variation of Bishop B5, where uh, that Korsnoy actually played. And I like this move better now in the stem game. And I'm going off the top of my head, but in the stem game. Uh, Morozevich at the bishop b5 wound up playing uh, bishop uh, to b8, I believe. I'm uh, sorry, knight to b8 or knight d7. And then Korsnoy wound up getting an e5 after castling it and, and stuff. So here, um, um, actually, yeah, he wound up, yeah, exactly playing uh, e5 and then knight d5 and so on. So here, um, Morozevich goes straight in for e5. So he kind of ignores the purpose of bishop b5, which is to play bishop takes c6, b takes c6, and then capture here, e5. Instead, he plays knight d7, figuring, hey, I'll just get that pawn back at another time. a3 is played, bishop a5, bishop f4. One thing you should learn about Morozevich's approach to this opening is that He's definitely will, willing to sacrifice pawns for activity. Many of these games, he's down a pawn or even two pawns, but he gets very active. Okay, so you can't be like materialistic when you, when you play this with this opening, at least if you're trying to play it uh, in his style. There's going to be times where um, you need to sacrifice some material in order in order to have activity and um that's the key is that you're playing for peace play right out of the opening when you do play knight c6 you know so your your mentality has to be that of you know active active play activity you know gaining uh gaining the initiative bishop takes g takes and now he gets the pawn back knight takes e5 plus there's a little threat there of knight takes f3 check so bishop takes queen takes e5 so now morozevich is the one that's holding on to the bishop now and we can say here the game is is equal you know rook a rook a e8 so opening success for uh morozevich against that line <clears throat> rook e6 right going for the kill right you got the open g file knight g3 queen f4 queen c5 bishop b6 Offering the exchange. And Moro wants to keep the queens on a little bit longer. See if he can exploit the uh, the H file. G6. Bishop B4. Rook F4. And now he wants to transfer that rook to H4 and attack H2. Queen E7. H4. And now Rook D8. Just getting the pieces off the board. 
as quick as possible. Rook f4. Um, Rook takes h2 could have been played, but then queen f6. And then uh, king g8. And then the uh, it's um, white is kind of in the driver's seat at the eight after e6 here. This is forced. And uh, white could keep checking, though. He could definitely go for more, you know, maybe at the uh, queen d8 or queen c6 or something. This is why Moro, I think queen d8 is probably stronger. But uh, this is why Moro played rook f4. So king g2, g5, and now h3. Queen g6. And now simply rook d1, h5, queen e7, and queen c8 was very strong, g4, and now rook d8, and now it's black's king that comes under scrutiny here, g takes f3 check, king h2 just simply ignoring that pawn, queen c2, Queen g5 check, king h7, and now queen takes h5. We can't let the black queen capture on f2. And then queen uh, h7, and it's going to just be mating too. You should be able to figure that out after uh, king g6. All right, so another good game from both both sides again we cannot blame the loss right moral moral had to resign we cannot blame the loss on the on the opening uh per se uh at this point the game is uh is just equal so basically moral overextended itself on the king side if we want to give a label to why he lost you know he overextended itself uh on the king side and trying to get you know too aggressive he overpressed he definitely he definitely overpressed here, um, but it's understandable why he played you know g5 like he was trying to cover this square, and then basically have his cake and uh, eat it too. It just didn't didn't work out uh, for him. All right, let's keep going. And like I said before, um, you know don't try to watch the whole video. I'm just putting everything together. So it's e it provides easy access for you guys out there. And again, please don't forget to like and subscribe. All that good stuff. Please donate to my channel. Support it. Um, tell your friends about it. And um, like I said, we're going to keep going. But like I said, don't feel like you got to watch two two straight hours or three hours or whatever, you know, of, of chess. If, you, if that's what you want to do, fine. But just know that i'm just putting everything together on this one video just for convenience sake that way you could watch you know whatever 30 minutes at a time and just keep coming back and you don't have to worry about going to another video or what have you so now we're going to get back in our time machine and we're going to go to round two and with the white pieces we have american grandmaster mark christensen Okay, I'm sorry, Mark Christensen. That's his middle name, Larry Christensen. Um, again, he chose this variation, and he was rated 2570 at the time, by the way. So e3, and he doesn't go for you know anything really uh, critical, you know, at this point. Like I said, I think knight f3 is probably either knight f3 or d5 are probably the most. Uh, Critical continuations. E3 is acceptable, but it gives Black a chance to, you know, take a step back and maybe throw a counter blow in there. So E5, now he plays D5. Bishop takes E4. Knight G6, Bishop uh, B4 check. B5 check, excuse me, Bishop D7. And we see Black consolidating his position uh, all he has to really worry about is this d5 pawn and possibly the reinforcement of it by e4 at some point b5 is played bishop b uh bishop b4 b4 
again removing a defender from the uh, d5 pawn bishop c1 and now e4 this prevents the um, connection of e4 and d5 being made so in effect we have isolated d pawn for white now knight g3 trying to attack defend knight c5 Moro doesn't want to give up that bishop um, that's a beautiful dark square bishop and uh, hey sometimes you might want to play a move like queen e5 and set up the mating battery on h2 you know say after h5 h4 etc knight b3 probing uh probing move knight h4 here and also the idea of coming to knight f uh coming to f5 all right one of the ideas is to remove that knight from the king side if you can So there goes the knight. Rook is attacked. And now it's Moro with the uh, extra space, the restrictive space in the center there. Moro starts his typical attack on the on the king's wing. And at this point. Uh, Moro had a um, yeah pretty strong continuation here. F five F five is a, a a nice continuation. You know, just at first glance. Let's see F five and um, hmm, Queen e six here. Got to be careful, right, not to get made it. But then you can grab this bishop. And then you have to just start sacrificing stuff. Knight takes e3. Yeah, because if... Yeah, if f takes e3. Yeah, rook d2. That just wins. That means queen would have to take. And then you could just go... Then you could go into the ending. Which is going to be favorable for black. Yeah. But... You got to look in about five moves for that. So maybe he... Decided to go with this move rook d6, which is like more obvious aesthetically, right? Just bringing the rook to the open file, uh, the g6 or e6. And so we have this ending reached where uh, Moro uh, Morozevich is uh, up a pawn, but has a rook for two knights, and the pawns are all. Um, you know, it's like, he has several pawn islands here. So the game is probably equal uh, dynamically at best. Because it's really hard to defend uh, everything against that rook since the pawns are so isolated. So Moro just simply keeps the knights together and there's a, a draw by repetition. So we saw the draw is pretty comfortable. Black has some chances, and we also can note that this line with this e3, knight c3, d takes e4, e3 is not super critical as far as Black is concerned. He didn't have, he didn't get into great trouble right there um, at the e5, d5, etc. Um, so you can see why most of the GMs, though, especially if you look at Marvazevich's losses. Uh, you know, they they fall in that line where white takes up the, the uh gauntlet throw down as far in you know as far as challenging the sender is concerned. Now we're playing against another big dog. This is round three of the PCA Intel tournament uh, Grand Prix. None other than uh Vasily Ivanchuk with the white pieces uh in his prime. Right. This is the this is the '90s of Van Chuck. This is the Van Chuck they were talking about. Um, you know, is going to be the one to take over the from Kasparov. You know, the next world championship. If you were around during that time, you already know this guy was like the genius. You know, he 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 was the next world champion at the Kasparov period. <laughs> so there's a young Morozevich at this time. Um, 2605. I think Marvis Avich is like 17 years old too, uh, going against a uh, young uh, Vanchuk. So here it is, Knight C3. 
D takes C D takes C four. Now he plays D five instead of Knight F three, which is per which I think are the most dangerous lines. Is this one in uh, Knight F three? He goes D five right away. Knight E five, and of course Knight F three prevents this move. Knight E five, but um, Van Chuck already has this move prepared. F four. Knight d7, and now we already have to have some kind of demerit from that, of that move in that the bishop is blocked on uh, c1, the scope of the bishop. Because after all, f4 is taking some space, but um, hmm, interesting move. But e4, now the center is looking intimidating, and you're looking, you know, like you have like a uh, almost like a four pawns attacking the alicons, but with the uh. The wrong colored pawn on c4. Knight b6. And that's what this position reminds me of. Is uh, Alicon defense. A, a four pawns attack. Bishop e3. And again as we always talk about. There's the attack on the center. It must come. Before white can you know, get consolidated with it. This is why bishop takes b6. Is important for white. It gets rid of that. C takes. Because he wants to maintain the center. B takes c4. Again, pressure, pressure, pressure. Knight f3. Knight f6. Castles. And now black castles. Um, if he takes here, let's say b, you know, he goes, he goes for it here. B takes c3. B takes c3. And knight takes e4. Of course, he would want to do that. However, the problem in this situation, besides this move, queen d4, is just a general lack of development in the black position. Like, look at white's position, development-wise, and look at black's. There's no way he survives here. It's just a rough rough position here for black already. I mean, you have knight d5. And you could just extend the cramp with d6. Castle. And, like, knight e5. This is brutal. This is why Marvel Castle first. Uh, and then if Anchuk, um played D takes. B takes. Excuse me, Bishop takes. And then Queen B3. So Marvel got a little bit of the job done. But the center is still very strong for white. And then if Anchuk starts putting pressure. Pressure on the position. Knight g4. Knight takes e6 with the fork. Moro wants to mate. Um, better move would have been this probably. Bishop c5. Um, I mean, what is what is black? What does white do here? Because now. If he does that, then this move is deadly right here. There's no there's no escape. Like so after h three, for example, and then you just play queen g three with the old idea, you know, of course mating here, but after this being forced, then you just play that. So bishop c c five check is definitely the move. This means that this is practically forced, right? And then Queen D four King h1, and then you can take here, and then you still have this threat. So, this is a move more Morozevich did not, um, that he missed or miscalculated. Instead, he went for the mate right away, but after h3, he doesn't have what, he doesn't have what he needs. This rook is still here, and if bishop here now, then knight would just take it. So now he, he plays rook a, uh, rook a e8. And of course the idea, he's trying, he's trying to tempt uh, Ivan Chuck into playing this move. And then of course, then the bishop comes over and it's going to be mate. <laughs> um, so knight e2, rook takes e6, queen takes e6, bishop c5, and again, now none of, the, none of this stuff works. You know, just just being short on short on time. Uh, knight f2 is just meant by king h2, by the way. So if he tries that, he just goes here because of the uh, h3 being there now. So king h1, h5, 
Rook a d1. Rook d8. Takes. Takes. And of course, with the reduction of material, white is just going to win, you know. So, Moro tries the best he can. And now he just goes into a uh, lost uh, ending. So, tough game running to, a, you know, one of the heavy hitters at the time in uh, Vasily uh, Ivanchuk. And you just see the, the central pawn just dominating, dominating down the board. After licking his wounds, Morozevich went on to play at the Yalta Rapid Tournament in 1995. And again, uh, he's playing Alexander Kalifman, with, who has the white pieces and a player he's familiar with. And uh, I believe their first match they played was a draw. Again, Kalifman chooses a line, which I don't, I don't think is uh, the most critical, but playable. I think e4 is the the best the best challenge to the position of black. Here, right out of the opening, <clears throat> he receives uh, he gets a decent position though. Um, I think here instead of moving the knight, I think it's better to challenge uh, white here. And just play e4. And perhaps white's best is pl to play knight g5 here. Um, because the take here just leads to this quick exchange of queens. And I don't think white has anything, uh, black has anything to fear. So to me, this is like the cr critical continuation move like knight g5. And again, we're not worried about this take because we're going to just trade queen. So h6. Knight here, knight, oops, knight here, knight here, then maybe just queen here with the idea, of course, if it takes, then you take, you know, d takes c6, queen takes e4. Um, if knight here, then you just fortify this pawn again and again I, I think that black is just okay i think that's the move those e4 instead of knight e7 anyway the game continued bishop takes c4 knight g6 because after h4 bishop d6 and h5 driving the knight back white has white has an advantage here let's let's be honest uh regardless of the result that might have happened in the game this is not the type of position you're trying to really uh, go in, but remember it is a rapid game here, so these type of things occur. So e4 is played, so Hollifman has secured a nice position, and it's up to Black to to uh, break the the shackles of this uh, space advantage that uh, White has accumulated now. And now he, you know, just seeks to accumulate more space, the queen side, and um, we can see Black's piece is being restricted to the third rank. Trying to trade pieces, one of the known remedies to cramp positions. Knight d6, putting a blockader on d6. Knight being the best uh, one to perform that duty. Bishop d3, bishop to f6, um, knight d2. Knight c5, and so we see uh, Morozavich has organized his pieces. So... He's actually working around the center of white. Knight b3. Bishop e3. So he's definitely taking the uh, bite out of white center by uh, reorganizing his pieces as such. In such a manner. He takes d4. Now white's piece gets driven away out of the center. B c Bishop d7. b3. b5. a takes. a takes. Knight cd2. And uh, knight d6 is probably better because after that, the other rook can just penetrate to the second rank. Rook c1, rook e8, and now it's white who's having problems. Now, rook c2, rook takes, 
Bishop takes c6. Again, relentlessly undermining and attacking the center. And now, out of the clear blue, you have three attackers on the center versus three defenders. Bishop g5, f4. The advanced pawn drops unceremoniously. And now f6, just, just eagerly, continuously attacking. Not showing any remorse. And uh, Kalifman had to resign. Again, that was a rapid uh, game. So our quick assessment of that game is basically that White was better in the beginning. That, um, and that he, you know, blundered or whatever. Time trouble. He started letting his position deteriorate. But know that this line right here for, uh, for White, though, uh, since we are talking about this opening in particular, it's not too, too critical. It's E3. E5, D5. Now, knight E7 is where white um, was able to get black in a little hot water uh, there with that move. After bishop takes E4, knight G6, H4. I, I like this for white. But instead of that knight E7, let's kill all of that with just E4, which I think is a superior superior move. Again, we talking about prime players. We're in the time machine now, so let's let's press the button. Let's get out of 1995. Fast forward to 1999, Frankfurt uh, West Masters tournament, round 12, February 7th, 1999. We have a young uh, Veselin Topalov, uh, in prime attacking player. You know, had a lot more hair. Back then, going against a young uh, Morozevich. By 1999, Morozevich was in the top 10 in the world, as well as uh, Topalov. So, um, again, still still trusting the uh, Shigorin. So, you've seen the Shigorin probably at the highest level that has ever been played since Shigorin was playing it. So, here we go. And... 99 is kind of like when the engines really started, you know, uh, getting stronger and stronger at this point. So, Marvazevich had to deal with that also with the computer analysis. And he's still trotting out the Shigorin. And just so you know, at this time, his rating was 27.23. And Topalov with the white pieces, 2700. So, what line did uh, Veselin chose? He chose the C takes D5 line, which is a good line also. Queen takes D5. E3 and he keeps it simple. Usually players will play this C takes D5 line and they're not prepared because it's real easy to the to, to follow. But um I think black is okay. Another option is to play B takes uh C3. However, he doesn't want to make his bishop bad, so he plays B C3 instead. This makes black's task a little easier in far as far as destroying the center is concerned though. So knight e2, bishop g4, f3. Castle, knight takes d4, knight f6, and queen a4. So you're saying, hey, wait a minute. Didn't he just hang a, um, you know, didn't he just hang the piece here with f takes d4? Um, well, sort of. Again, Marvin Davis is playing super dynamic. The idea here is to play rook hd8. And he definitely has some kind of compensation for the, for the, uh, for this up uh, for this piece here um there's no doubt about that i mean he's attacking this right here um so what's the options here um let's say queen e2 right to protect this pawn and maybe uh prepare castle and queen side um So if we try that, you have some options here. It's black, knight e4 perhaps. So if you castle queen side, you're going to bust this open. I don't know, rook c1. Knight takes. Takes, check. Bishop c3 now. And say queen b6. So interesting, inter interesting position. Um, again, does does uh, black have enough for the piece? It's hard to tell. But this is 
again, if you're not prepared and you get faced with this, it's like, whoa, you know, it's white. And you could be better, like, of course, like, you know, looking at an engine or something, white could be theoretically better, but it's like, uh, it's like one mistake, one mistake, and you could be just, like, worse. And I'm not even sure if white is better here. I think, like I said, I, I would like to play black from here. So, it's one of those deals. <laughs> you know, again, Mario was a very creative play. He probably, like, analyzed this and was like, alright, I'm going to leave that bishop there on G4. Topalov is one nothing to do with it. He probably didn't haven't looked at this position since he was a junior chess player. So now all of a sudden he's faced with this weird sacrifice and you know he's just like, all right, let me just get my pieces out. So now Moro attacks e3, still leaves the piece there. Knight takes c6, queen takes e3, bishop e2, rook h e8. Ninety five. So Moro winds up giving up a piece anyway. And he has a similar type of position. However, White has a little bit more activity here. And he trades some uh trades some pieces off. Now material is uh almost equal. He has a pawn uh for the exchange. Is it enough? Probably not. Now he has two pawns for the exchange. Is it enough? Probably. So now he has two pawns for the exchange. They go into this end game. And of course he has to push his assets which are those those pawns. Topalov does a great job of demobilizing those pawns. By sticking the king in there. And then at the right time, he sacrifices. But, again, it should it looks like, um, you know, Moro has more space, etc. But, when Topolov made this sac... Uh, excuse me, Topolov made this sacrifice, believe me. He already knew the outcome of this endgame. Because at this level, the Grandmaster, even the International Master... He's not going to give that exchange up unless he knows he's going to win. He's not doing this just to, you know, get a, a a swindle or something like that. He's already calculated. So his calculated ca calculation is either right or he messed up. So there it is, G4. F6. This is important because it's a Zug, it's a Zug Zwing um, situation. Here and at this point, Marvazevich Mar is lost. Um, <clears throat> F6 is a mistake. The one position he try to avoid here is uh, a position where all three of these pawns are on the fifth rank lined up together. Like this one is here, this one is here, and this one is here because there's a lot of breakthrough. There's a break breakthrough tricks beginning with uh, G6 that occur. And Moro is, of course, trying to avoid that. But instead of F6, perhaps he should have did H5 instead. And just simply break up the pawns. So, for example, here. And then play a move like this. And let's say after H4, he still has the opposition. Uh, you know, because black has to move. But instead... He plays here, because you have to calculate this. This pawn is going to drop, but then this pawn will drop too. And these double pawns will count as one pawn. These pawns being lined up don't mean anything at this point. So king d5, king b4, king e4. King, king, right, king b4, king g3, and then you have this race. And of course, you have to calculate all of this. These players are strong enough to do that. Then you have the, uh, you know, you probably have like some kind of perpetual at this point. Right? Or maybe even black has chances if he could get these two pawns and somehow preserve this, this pawn. All right? Instead, he does this move, F6. 
F6 and now this gets fixed and to me what and again this is a whole different topic altogether I don't want to get into end games right now have a lot of end game videos too the problem with this move here is that this pawn this pawn exerts great power in the position so any kind of maneuver like g5 or g6 white is just going to take here okay once you get this pawn structure now here matter of fact let me just do it so let's say g5 this is the whole fallacy in the move f6 this is what happens and it's real plain to see then you just play h4 it's a wrap because how are you going to stop this idea of this past pawn here? You're not going to do that. If you do that, then just h5 anyway. This is the problem with f6. You can't do f6 there. So that's a big blunder. I don't know if he was in time trouble or what. Because you create this off-balance pawn structure and it's like boom. And then there's no way to stop it. Kings are on the other side of the board. This is why black must play the move himself he allowed this move f5 now he gets on the idea but it's too late so he played now he plays h5 and again his idea he has the same idea but it doesn't work here because he's immobilized his pawn notice how he plays the exact same idea but with the pawn on f6 instead of f7 now g takes h5 king d5 And look what happens, King E5, King E5, and you had the same, the same scenario, but just down the tempo. And Tobolov just gets the king back. Easy money. So that's an end game you can study there. There's no like Morrow shouldn't have lost that one. He did lose. He had to resign. Um. They, he was trying to avoid that ending, which was... But notice the difference again here in this position. With this pawn advanced to f5, right? Black has the extra tempo that's needed. You see? The, uh, with, instead of this pawn being here, it's here. So white doesn't have time to get back here. Therefore, he has to advance his pawn. He has to commit to that. In the actual game, the pawn is on f6. So now, with the pawn here, instead of being here, white has plenty of time to get back. And that, and and of course, there's no way white's getting going to be able to, you know, deal with this pawn. This pawn to get over here, and even if black was able to get over. White would eat up these pawns already. So end games are important.